Oh, wait, wait, say that, but it's just burning, burning cross? Yeah, burning, burning cross. cross. Three, it's three crosses no. on the thing. And e the, either the label is called the burning cross or the triple crosses or something. And basically, this particular one that I have is called Marching with the K Clan. And it's, you know, it's kind of a marching thing, and they're singing Marching with the Clan and on and on and on, mm -hmm. what they're going to do. Now, the Johnny Rebel uh, ones, they're 45, and they probably have 78 somewhere uh, along the way. But the 45s probably came much later than the 78s, because, you know, 78s was mm -hmm. a special type. Was yeah, yeah, exactly. This, this time I, some, I ran some old records. You know that really, if you drop it, they break yes. they shatter. Yeah. Right. 78s, because yeah. my grandmother used to have those things. Exactly. Yeah. Remember when we were kids, even the record players, I don't know if they still do, because my, many people are doing DVDs and CDs and so on. But the old record play, players, the R, I mean, the... the um, Speed yep. had a 33, a right. 45, and, and a 78. 78. Yeah. You know I'm what I mean? Right. I have a, a turn turntable down there. I don't even know if it has 78 on it, and I rarely ever use it. I just use it whenever I'm going to play Johnny Rebel or something that's old or old Temptation album or something like that. But the Johnny Rebel stuff is very interesting because uh, I have about four or five of the 45s, right? And one that I used to take, I, I bought them because I would take them to, to my class and when I'm doing sessions on you know, racism, things like just to let the people hear the kind of music. And I have to be honest, the music was very interesting, barring the lyrics, good country music. Sure, sure. You know, it was just, it's just I music. Can, I need to be dancing to Yeah, it's right? just country music. The lyrics was something else, right? So on one side of one record, and I can only remember the two sides of this particular record, on one side, the, uh, the, uh, the cut was, niggas just smell that way, oh. right? On the other side, it was Martin Luther Coon. Oh, you know what I mean. If we had some time, I, I'd even go and find them for you, you know. But yeah, Martin Luther Coon, you know, and then, you know the song would go, "Niggas just spell that way," you know, that country, mm -hmm. you know, they would go on and country and so yeah, 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 Martin Luther Coon and so on and so on. And then the other ones had different different cuts. I would take them to class because students actually didn't believe. Uh, for some reason that these things did not exist, so I would bring them in and we do a whole session critical analysis of these of different musical genres. In fact, mm -hmm. I just hired somebody at Kane University, a well-known musician in the area here, and you might even know about him, Atiba Wilson, he's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He's a, a flutist, you know. Some people say flautist, it can be yeah. pronounced both ways, but you know, he's a flutist. And got a numbers of recordings out there. And I just hired him because I created a course, me and uh, Renee McLean, the son of the jazz legend Jackie McLean, who I grew up with. It. We created a course called uh, Music of the African American Experience. And again, I just want to let you know that that title is a strategic title just to get it through the university. I, my The original name was Music of the African World Experience. But for political reasons, I had to manipulate it so that it would be palatable to the university people and it took a while to get it through right and so i finally got it through so R renee couldn't teach the uh, course for the fall this year he will pick it up in the spring so i hired atiba wilson and he who, who's also a musical genius right and you know he doesn't even know about these records that i have here he knows mm -hmm. about the genre mm -hmm. and so i may you know let him use or record it uh, record the sound so that he can take it, I guess, to uh, in his class and play it on DVD. I record it onto the computer or something like that. Very, you can learn a lot. Again, talking about you know the Trump era uh, and whatnot. If you listen to some of these songs, I mean, not only do you hear Trumpism in in the song in all shape, forms, and fashion, uh -huh. it, it's a clear window to the mind. Uh, and the sickness of white supremacy. Okay. Very, very clear. And this stuff goes all the way back. And that's 78, marching with the Klan. <laughs> it's, it's just... Can I ask... Uh, yeah. Uh, is it your thought that um, in terms of the music that this is a true reflection of what they're thinking at, at a particular time? Or do... In other words, are they more relaxed when people are, are singing these songs? As opposed to, you know, you're you're trying to think about, oh, I shouldn't be saying these things. They're not even worrying about it. They're in their, well, back they're in, in their, you know, like they're comfortable yeah. in their group. So <laughs> this is what they're really When these about? recordings were made, I don't believe that anybody, quote unquote, who was a part of the white community was at 
the least bit, at least the vast majority of people were the least bit concerned about it. It was a part of the world that everybody existed in. And racism, as I always pointed out, to this very day, is natural. And something that's natural for the country, most people don't think about. It's just the way things are. You know, uh, black people are inferior. Everybody would accept that on some level. Uh, Those who didn't accept that would be the minority in terms of the white populace. (laughs) And much of what they would accept, not realizing it, was so normal that they themselves were contributing in something in the way of thought, speech, and action to the overall support of the pattern of racism. But those things were not considered as virulent to them as just the outright what the Klan was saying. So you'll have people up in the North who might have been opposed to the outright uh, unrefined racism of the Klan and other people in the South, but yet and still here in the North were practicing on a large level racism, which was normal, and they were doing those things thinking they were not doing it. Keeping in mind that racism doesn't have to be something that's conscious. It can also be unconscious, where people contribute to the overall pattern of racist thought, speech, and action, thinking that they're doing something nice or thinking that they're not like that. Graphic example, if you read some of the uh, uh, the journals of slave owners on plantations in the South and others, other places, in those journals, they write about themselves as being very, very beneficial quite often to black people who they were holding in bondage. And so they'll say things like this. Uh, They'll say things like, you know, I am so good to the Negro. I'm so Mm -hmm. good to the Negro because today I gave Caesar an old pair of pants and I gave Margaret an old blah, 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 or I uh, let Caesar have a few hours to himself today. And that to themselves meant that they were beneficial to a population of people that they they enslaved. Uh, And so they thought of themselves in quite beneficent terms as compared to what we would think about them, no matter what Mm -hmm. the terms were, you know. Mm -hmm. And so again, it was normal and natural for them by and large to think the way they think, holding a people in bondage in many respects. Again, as I always point out, uh, publicly and privately, racism in the United States and and probably in the world is normal. You know, it operates in a normal fashion where people become enculturated to the patterns of racism and nobody has to think about it. Even black folks don't have to think about it. You know what I mean? Black folks can be in a mode to genuinely accept the more refined levels of racism, not even knowing that they're being affected by it. Generally, quite often, black people respond to the more overt forms of racism. The cop does this and someone does that. That type of thing, while the more sophisticated and refined forms of racism is probably more virulent and affects us more than the outright versions. And that happens in an institutional way. It happens in the institutions. It happens uh, in all manner of subtle ways that we just accept for granted. And to some degree, we often uh, participate in it and support it ourselves in our thought, speech, and action on very mundane levels where people obviously quite often think that it has no effect at all. I make a case, and I know many, many people disagree with me, just on the conscious subliminal level, just our use of the N-word, thinking that it doesn't mean anything, thinking that we've captured it, and that it no longer has a sting or a bite, affects the subconscious. And it affects the subconscious on a subliminal level in our way, in, in, in this way, so that in our actual behaviors with one another, that is implanted in our subconscious, being reinforced by the overall patterns of racism in society. And so as I point out to people, you say it doesn't mean anything, but yet and still it means everything as long as white supremacy exists. If Mm -hmm. white supremacy didn't exist, then that word probably would not exist. Mm -hmm. Everything has a meaning under conditions in which white supremacy exists that it wouldn't have if white supremacy didn't exist. So you can't say the word doesn't have any meaning. What it does mean is that you are not aware of how it's affecting Mm -hmm. the subconscious. How would the three-year-old girl know that the word, the N word, doesn't mean something. Mm-hmm. And we're growing up in a situation where white supremacy overall, the patterns are controlling our thought, speech, and action. And so it has a meaning. And so on that level, on the very subliminal levels and on other levels, we actually, to a large degree, support our own oppression just by not having our thoughts liberated. And quite often, the black person whose thoughts are not liberated takes a position directly or indirectly against a black person who does have their thoughts liberated. And I'm not saying this is Mm. always the case, but quite often 
we become the first line of defense sometimes for white supremacists and our arguments against the liberating thought. When we argue against the use of liberating language, we're supporting them on another kind of level. You know, and so all of these little things amount to something uh, under conditions of what, in which white supremacy exists. Once again, everything has a meaning under conditions in which white supremacy exists that they would not have if white supremacy didn't exist. How do we, what would you consider to be uh, more problematic? The, um, the fact that if we're, we're like a victim of the subliminal messaging, mm -hmm. okay, that means we're, it's, you're, like you're saying, it's like under the radar, you're not even aware right. or, you know, that, it's, that it's happening. And at some level, over time, you just accept that this is the That's way called it enculturation. Is. That's enculturation. You grow up in a particular culture, culture and all of the norms in the culture, uh, you learn culture by simply growing up in it. That's right. what we mean by mm -hmm. enculturation. Mm -hmm. And all of those social norms, whatever the norms are, you just simply accept until somebody tells you different. This is where we get people that were very good at what they did, Dr. King, Martin, uh, uh, Malcolm, mm -hmm. and other people who did that, you know, uh, Francis Welsing, people who are aware who then educate us to understand what the nuances of the system uh, are all about. Okay. But until that point, most people never question the culture that they grow up in. It is just what it is. We grow up in it, we learn it, and again, we don't question it until Somebody either tells us or we come up with a brainstorm. We see something, you know, it's not right. In my particular uh -huh. case, I was born this way. You know, not born with information, but born with an inquisitive mind. Uh -huh. And I always felt, and all of my friends can tell you, that includes Sam Copeland, we all, all of us who grew up together, you know, John Sidberry, you know, mm -hmm. we all grew up together. And they can only always tell you that I had an inquisitive uh -huh. mind. I knew something was instinctively wrong, I didn't know what it was. And I had no words for it. I knew something was wrong when I saw Tarzan on TV and Tarzan would yell and all the brothers and sisters would run away. That had to be incorrect, you know? But we were inundated with it and I had no response to that. I remember Frank Garcia, you remember Frank Garcia? Uh, I remember Frank Garcia and I one time at his house when we were kids, we might have been about 10 years old, and we were playing the dozens with one another. And I said to him, well, some program on TV, and I said to him, you come from Spain. Of course he doesn't. He's mm -hmm. Puerto Rican. You come from Spain. And he said to me, you come from Africa. That shut down the entire discussion. I had no retort to that. None. All right? Once he said that, we were all just joking. But he said, you come from Africa. And that brought up the Tarzan and the Jungle Jim and the Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. All those things that we saw at, as kids. Yeah. No retort. In the oil and pot. But I knew something was wrong with it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that was being re reinforced in school. Frank and I were, we went through public school, all of us went through public school together. And I remember one teacher in public school, her name was Miss Kerry, right? And she was, she was from the South, and she would read us stories, you know, that she grew up with in the South. Now, when we were kids, she was already pretty, seemed to us pretty old. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, she was at least in her 60s. She was teaching the third or fourth grade, you mm -hmm. know, at that po point in time. And this is in the 50s, so, you know, if she's that old, she had to be born in the late 1800s, the late 19th century, because she clearly was at least 60 or something mm -hmm. like then, right? And this is like the early 50s. And she would read this story in class, uh, Little Black Sambo. Now, I know you probably yeah. heard, you know, that kind of thing. Well, many people don't know that Sambo is a very honorable name in Africa, but that's another story in and of itself. And the way she read it, this reinforced what Frank had said to me and what other people About said to me. Man. Yeah, that kind of <laughs> exactly. She said, he was, I'm just, yeah. He was so black, and his lips were so big, and his eyes were so white, and all of us as kids not knowing anything, especially the mm -hmm. black kids, you know, black and mostly black and, and Puerto Rican or Latino, and a few whites. The low east side at that particular point in time where we lived at in the projects, Lillian Wall, Bruce, Jacob Reese, Veladik, Smith, all of those low east side projects had a good number of white people still in it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mostly Jews living in the projects and so on and so forth, right? And we would all giggle and laugh and she would reinforce that with some other stereotypical thing. For me, it wasn't until my mind was still asked, in the back of my, something is wrong with this, mm -hmm. this picture. It wasn't until 
I met Dr. John Henry Clark, and I, I can't even say I met him, I heard him downtown, and I was, well, I might have been 11 or something like that. And what he said makes sense, but it was a brief thing that he was presenting because he wasn't the guest speaker, he was just, somebody introduced him. Mm -hmm. Then my eyes got awakened when I saw Malcolm X on 125th Street in front of the Teresa Hotel on a platform, and that was the rude awakening for me because I could not walk away. And uh, he was speaking. I don't. I can't even recall what he was speaking about now. But I can tell you, it was penetrating. Mm -hmm. It was super, and it was filling my mind up. Right. My godmother used to own a uh, uh, millinery shop right at the the base of the Teresa Hotel. Mm -hmm. Her name was Cleo Sims. All right. She owned a millinery shop there, and I was really coming uptown. I was going to stop to see her and see my grandmother. But there, Malcolm was out in front. So when the thing was over. Uh, I asked the man in the crowd, I said, well, excuse me, so who was, who was that speaking? And he said that was Mr. X. I didn't know the Malcolm mm -hmm. part yet, right? He just said Mr. X. And so the crowd dispersed and I went into the, the millinery shop, said a few words to my godmother, but it lingered. It lingered. I had no new stuff, but it, it, it was penetrating, right? So I went back and I told a couple of friends of mine, Frank and other people that I grew up, people you wouldn't know. They weren't mm -hmm. menacing or pen and scroll people mm -hmm. on the lower east side. And they rejected, you know, a, a yeah. lot of, in fact, even before Frank died, he said, he told me, he said, back then, I couldn't understand where you were going with all this black stuff. You know, and it wasn't like I was saying a whole bunch of stuff to them. I was just saying what I had learned, right? Mm -hmm. And Frank actually said that to me. You know, he says, you know, I, you know, I just back then I just couldn't understand this obsession you had with. Now I understand. This is what he would say. Now I understand. Okay. And so that gave me the courage that Malcolm thing. And I went into the, the to uh, into the millinery shop. My grandmother, I mean, my godmother said, "That's." Uh, Malcolm X out there. I didn't ring a bell. Didn't didn't know anything, right? At 12 years old, didn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that gave me the courage. And I know Anthony, you remember this. Mm -hmm. On 100, I know you remember this too, Diana. 125th Street. Mr. Michelle had a bookstore, mm. and on top it had all these pictures yep. of black people, yeah. yep. and oh, a big oh. sign that said "A House of the Million, a Million Books About the Negro." Remember that? Mm. And it was right next to, I think, Bush's Diamond Store, somewhere yep. over there, yep. or yep. Ripley's, mm -hmm. you know, <coughs> where the state office building is, but like on the corner, you know, yeah. and whatnot. That gave me the courage to go into that bookstore, which terrified me because back then, of course, you didn't want to hear anything about black people. Bye -bye. Being because positive. black wasn't even a positive. It, it, exactly, uh, and we would we would fight over that. Yeah. yeah, you know. But I had the courage to go into that bookstore, you know, and it wasn't very large inside. You know, I went in, and uh, uh, Mr. Michelle gave me two books that I would later get. And I didn't read the books at that time, but I would later get the same two books when we were pledging the pen and scroll. Okay. You know what I mean? And I guess Jerry Donaldson he must, must have, have been in that made school. the yeah, arrangement yeah. because most of the books are back at, at, at when Penn and Scroll started were being paid for by How You At. Because oh. we got a lot of stuff free. Uh -huh. I don't know if oh. you know that. Yeah, okay. The books would be, the, all of that free material was by and large being paid for by How You At. And How You At was a political thing. It, 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 exactly. That that it, it, exactly. So the two books that I got from Penn and Scroll and the two books that I got from him was, and it was just a coincidence, I don't know why it was exactly, maybe one of them was different. Penn and Scroll, we, the two books we got, because I was on the second line. Okay. And oh. I dropped out. Oh, okay. I was on the second, Frank, me, Frank, you know, I was on the mm -hmm. second line, but I dropped out because I was facing peer pressure on the, on the, on the Lower East Side, and it was out of jealousy that my close friends did not want me to continue because they weren't doing it. Oh. And I succumbed to that peer pressure. That's why I dropped out of the second line. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But anyway, the two books that we got, that Jerry brought, was, got for us, was... A Hundred Amazing Facts About the Negro mm. okay. by J.A. Rogers. Yep. And the second book was A Glorious, Glorious Age in Africa by Daniel Cho, I think it was, and mm. somebody else. Mm. Well, Mr. Michaud gave me A Hundred Amazing Facts About the Negro, and then he gave me a, another one, A Glorious Age in Africa. Right? Mm. And, you know, and I think that was by Elliot Skinner. Right. <laughs> Historian Elliot Skinner. And I didn't read those books at the time. Actually, I didn't read them because I was so terrified until <laughs> just carrying the books or? I had them at home oh, oh okay right. until uh, Pen and Scroll gave us those books then I read the books mm -hmm. and I can tell you the reaction to my reading those books by people in the family but they, they were terrified my grandmother who lived in Esplanade Gardens right I brought the books 
after a meeting, right, I brought the books there, right? Me and Frank stopped up there to get something to eat. And she saw those two books, right? And the first words out of her mouth, mouth was, Oh my God! The boys are gonna be like that, Mr. X. You know, oh, they you because they saw him as a, you know, as a, as a threat. She would later, she, yeah, as a terror. a terror. You know what I mean? Here's a man's outspoken, saying things about white society yeah. that every black person knew then, and to a large degree, some people now uh -huh. felt that if you say something about white people, that's going to cause nothing but harm mm, yeah. to you and those mm. who you love and those who are around you. Even to this very day, and let's admit it, mm. I see this quite often, all right? People quite often don't realize they're doing it. If black people are having a serious conversation about white society or racism or whatever it may be, and a white person walks by, generally black people lower their voices. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Uh, but I'm thinking that. Yeah. Makes sense. Or... If they don't lower their voices, they just feel uncomfortable. Mm. You know what I mean? You can see it in their body language because this what they know from history and slavery that this white person can cause massive damage. You know, one single white person can cause massive damage to a whole lot of, of black folks. Mm -hmm. And by and large, white people to a large degree. Uh, I can name some scholars. Yeah, we, we call it we call it lineage memory. Yeah. yeah. I can name some scholars right now. Uh, where white people have gone into their office on the college campus or uh, in the classroom and see one book that they disagree with and cause massive havoc and damage Just to, that, one book? to that particular scholar. Here's okay. one e example. The great scholar who wrote a lot on Marcus Garvey, Tony Martin. He was up at Wellesley College. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Some white person he had on a syllabus on his desk. I remember well, Tony mentioned this to me one time, right? Because we used to bring him to Kane a lot. The book was, <coughs> the book by the Nation of Islam, you know. Well, I can't remember the exact title of The Real Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, right? Oh, yeah. I right? They saw that book and went to the school administration and caused all of this stuff for Tony, you know, on, on the campus. And far as I know, Tony wasn't even using the book as a major book for his class, you know. But that one person created a firestorm up there at Wellesley College, and Tony had to respond to, you know. Oh, wow. And he wrote, Tony wrote a subsequent book dealing just with that kind of thing, you know, with, with the Jewish community and other communities that were attacking him just based upon having the book in his possession, mm. so to speak. And that was enough. Yeah, and so these kinds of things... Wait, 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 you're, you're going too far afield. No, no, you, tell me that story about the Protocols of Zion or whatever, whatever that, that, that was on the... Uh, that's, that's Henry Ford, you know, who was a well-known anti-Semite. And who, if you want to get trouble in trouble, with Jewish people, Mention something. Yeah, the Protocols of Zion is the book mm -hmm. that you, that's, no, no, that's no, going to happen. I got it, but it's supposed to be a fiction. But let, let me ask you something. Right. No, but you said there was a book, there was something at your campus that somebody had that book out. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, the Jewish people bought it. But yeah. They wrote, <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. Well, what, ha what happened was at camp, we had a number of explosions at Kane University, okay, over the course of years. The first explosion mm -hmm. was uh, 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 involving Dr. Leonard Jeffries, our brother. All right, our brother's lecture, Empire State Speech. Jews on campus, the Jewish community on campus, um, were upset about his, his speech, right? And he was a member of, Lenny, was a member of our external advisory committee to Africana Studies. All right? Mm -hmm. All right. They demanded, more or less, that we remove him from the external advisory committee because of his New York State speech and so on and so on. And we refused. So that set the campus in a tailspin. People were at each other's throats and so on. We said, we, Lenny is a respected men of, member of our community, a respected scholar, and we ain't moving him. Mm -hmm. You may have problems with Lenny, but we don't. Okay. And he ain't said nothing on this campus. Mm -hmm. And we're not moving, we're not removing him. You know, simple as that. Like that. Okay. All the people you folks bring here, on, we're not removing Lenny. You know, Lenny is still on it. You know what I mean? We're, we're not removing Lenny. So that was the first thing. The second explosion, this is where the things that you're talking about comes in. The second explosion, because before that there was no issue. <laughs> the second explosion was, and this is little known, <laughs> that uh, the members of the student organization on campus, which is the student body, wanted to, uh, 
they were looking for a, a black speaker to come on campus to talk about the real relationship between blacks and Jews. Well, that was the name of it. I saw that. Yeah. The real relationship. Right. They talked about they wanted the speaker to come on. Right. And the uh, student org primarily was mostly composed, at least at that time, of white students. There might have been maybe two black students, but I can only remember one who happens to be a student of mine. I'm not going to mention his name, but anyway, mm -hmm. he was on the uh, on the board, and he happened to be a member of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. and so he suggested that he knows somebody who could tell the real relationship between blacks and Jews, That's right? Okay. And the person he proposes proposed was Khalid Muhammad. Muhammad. Mm -hmm. All right, and so Khalid Muhammad used to be the uh, the national spokesman for the Nation of Islam under Minister Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it, they brought... He, he's he's sent, uh, since uh, passed. Yeah. Right? yeah, they brought Khalid Muhammad on campus. Now, the thing that, when it hit the, the fan, many people blamed the black community at Kane University. Almost no black person knew he was coming because it was... The, because it was... Uh, we weren't notified. I'm one of the people that knew that he was going to be coming because uh, the student that I mentioned was a student of mine and I wanted to sit down and at least meet with Khaled to let him know what the uh, political climate was like on campus because of the Leonard Jeffries, but unfortunately he wasn't able to do it. Yeah. All right. So he comes on campus and then you know about the firestorm that ensued. He says some things and by the way, virtually everything he said in this lecture was true. What got him in trouble was the name calling, when he started name calling. Okay. You know. No, but in what way was he name name called? Yeah. Remember I mean, what uh, uh, Jesse Jackson wants to high me town and things like oh, that. Oh, that, okay. that kind of thing. That's oh. what really got him in trouble. Mm -hmm. The body of his lecture really. I wasn't there, and most of us weren't there. But I had to tape, and I still have to tape somewhere around. Oh, okay. That wasn't. You know, it was. It was that. So after that, subsequently, for all of our programs, not just Africana Studies, the student programs, the black student programs, we'd, we would invite book vendors and people that would sell different things, you know, garments and mm -hmm. a variety of things. And so one book vendor on his table had all kinds of books, right? The Protocols of Zion, all, you know, books about slave, all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. So it just so happens that some members of the Jew Jewish community saw that, all right? And they were up in arms about that. Mm -hmm. All right, they didn't want these books being sold on campus. Okay? okay, my response to that was that number one, there were all kinds of books books that were, you know, and that was like book banning. Yeah, books, mm -hmm. books that were not even, you know, uh, beneficial to us. They were just books, you know, that kind of thing. So, my response to that was, uh, you know, all of a sudden we're gonna ban books, mm -hmm. you know, and we're not gonna allow people who, you know, want to read books, read books, and make their own decisions. But what happened, and I also pointed out that, well, are you going to also purge the libraries? Because these same books that are on the table here are also in the mm -hmm. library. And I mm -hmm. pointed out where they were in the library, right? But the interesting phenomenon about this, and it became a major issue on campus, and it still affects us to this very day in terms of book vendors. The major issue of that was they didn't want the books sold on campus, right? They didn't want anybody to see the books, but all of the people who would buy the books from the vendors were Jewish. <laughs> You know, and the reason we know that is because uh -huh. we saw them buying the books and then they would come to certain meetings that we would all be in with the books saying that they don't want the books sold on campus, but they were the ones who were buying the books. But you now know? with these um, uh, uh, officials in the, in the college? That they were professors. professors. Oh, oh. They were professors. They just had a problem. Yeah, I don't know if any high-ranking college officials yeah. bought the books. You know, I didn't see them, but I know professors who I actually saw with my own eyes buy the books and they would discuss the books, you know what I mean? But they were the ones who were purchasing it. Mm -hmm. And then subsequent to that, then there was another vendor that came that had DVDs on the book. They had a DVD with uh, Kwame Torre, Stokely Carmichael, yeah. mm -hmm. speaking to a Jewish organization, I believe at the New School or someplace else. Mm -hmm. And then it had something with Dr. Yosef ben Yekin and a lecture by him. Mm -hmm. and, he is Jewish. Right, and they didn't want those sold on campus. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know what I mean? That type of thing. And so we've had these, you know, these uprising at various points in time. And it's, to a large degree, changed what black studies and black students on campus can do in terms of inviting people on campus who sell books, yeah. you know, artifacts and things of that nature, you know. So it's, it's, a lim it's keeping, um, you know, they just don't want it at all. And, and that's, the, that's the feeling now in, in terms of... Um, uh, like cutting out your 
freedom to well we haven't have invited a book vendor in a long time and nor has any other so that's been affected then. yeah it, no uh, no no other black organization that i know about on campus has invited book vendors there are people who come who sell jewelry jewelry and things of that nature you know books. hats and clothes uh -huh. but the the books you know we we basically stopped doing now they've stopped doing that you know that kind of thing and even when we tried to invite various book dealers book vendors to come they didn't want to come so we couldn't even get a book vendor if we wanted to get one because of going through this, you know, the system of, you know, being stigmatized and so on and so forth. So there have been some some problems as a result of that. I don't know how we got from the records yeah, to here, but, no, you know, but nonetheless. Is that what we, we wanted to? Yeah. Well, no, racism, racism is far reaching. I want yeah. to thank you both for, for this. We're going to we're going to end it here if you don't mind. We can do something else later.